Hey, welcome to the Fireside Tattoo Podcast, the official podcast of the Fireside Tattoo Network. My name is Jake, and I am super excited to bring this episode to you today. I know I say that about every episode, but I am excited about every episode. I like to put out episodes. But this one's special. This one is special because I got the opportunity to sit down in Southern Illinois in the backwoods with in my mind, the godfather of modern tattooing, the guy who really changed what I thought tattooing was in the late 90s, uh, Mr. Guy Aitchison. Now, let me tell a story about Guy real quick before I go too far into this introduction. Uh, in whatever Hurricane Katrina was um, uh, down in New Orleans, about that time, Randy Muller, who if you don't know him, is just a stellar tattooer, uh, he was coming back from Guy's shop after getting uh, this this lower leg kind of sleeve, and he was tattooing at our shop at Underground Art while his city was underwater. And I saw this tattoo that Guy had done. It was kind of a skull cave thing. It was all in these ochres and whites. And I saw it when it was like eight or nine hours old, and it completely turned tattooing upside down for me. It just like... Everything I thought I knew about tattoos was turned on its head. I didn't understand how he pulled it off. It blew my mind, my jaw dropped, and it had me rethinking and kind of backpedaling and trying to figure out what I was doing wrong or what guy was doing right. And, and of course, this is in a time of tattooing before we were able to like Instagram Live everything that we did. And, and we had no idea how people did what they did. Your, your only real education was in tattoo magazines. You know, in my case, I would go to Bookstar on the weekends or Barnes and Noble, whatever you had, and, and I would pull up Tattoo, an international tattoo, and I would see people like Guy, you know, with, with his bio-organic stuff. I would see realism from like Tom Renshaw. I would see, you know, these guys that were doing stuff that were beyond my capability, but I had no idea how they were doing it. And this thing that Randy came in with on his leg was like nothing I'd ever seen before. I had no idea how to interpret it, how to approach it as a tattooer. And so that was my first real introduction to Guy Aitchison in, in real life. And so fast forward, however many years that is, and, and I've got the luxury of sitting down and watching him work, uh, which we can take for granted really, really easily now because we can see people work so, so often. You know, you have shows like ours, you have, you know, Tattoo Now, you have guys reinventing the tattoo, you have stuff that Sullen is doing. We have all this stuff that like, let's us see the, the process of our favorite artists, but we didn't have that back then. And, um, and so it's really, really special to me to get to sit down and watch someone that was such a, a huge influence uh, on, on my work or someone that really challenged my ideas of, of what was possible in tattooing. So, to make a short story long, I got to go sit down and watch a guy tattoo, and uh, I set up a little camera. I set it up over his shoulder. I set one up to like to to get our faces. One up to get the um, the shot over his uh, while he was tattooing, and um, and we made an episode out of it. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. We talked a little bit about everything. We talked about his new project that he. Well, it's not a new project. He's been working on this book, um, the uh, Biomech Encyclopedia. He's been working on it for years and years. It's about to launch. We talked a little bit about reinventing the tattoo, some of his ideas on online tattoo education, which is really um, a big thing to me. You know how we're how we're teaching technical information online now, which is kind of a, has always been a taboo in the tattoo world. We got to get his ideas on that, his opinion on that. So it was a, it was a lot of fun. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and uh, make sure to thumb us up. Let us know what you think. Thank you. All right, you guys ready? We'll do this. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. Oh, you can't see my face at all. I'm like blinded. Our people are blinded by the light trying to see me. I'm the headless voice. Uh, this is Guy. This is Gabe. Thank you guys for tuning in. We're on day two here with, uh, with Guy and Gabe working on this forearm piece that... When, when, when did you guys say you started this? Like, you said maybe three or four years ago? No, oh, more than that. Oh, okay. So it's it's lasered skin, right. which tends to be a little bit <clears throat> trickier to, to make things actually stay in. Yeah. Uh, and I tend to start a little bit on the, I guess, more painterly side and, and push things into a more graphic place as needed. And this piece 
you know, it's it's got a lot of delicate atmospheric effects and that kind of thing, and um, it was just never quite clear and bold enough to really uh, hold up against all that lasering and uh, and the needs of the cover up. So that's one of the things that we've been doing this visit is to make everything a lot bolder and clearer and a little bit more graphic, and uh, you know, and you know, even even directly taking a page from. Uh, from what you've been doing, yeah. Since you're you're, uh, you know, you've got this very nice graphic yet painterly look. You've got these big brush strokes that are uh, nice and readable and clear. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah. And uh, so to try to apply a little bit of that towards this kind of thing is, is only going to add to its, uh, you know, readability in the short term and you know longevity in the long term. Right, yeah. And that's always the kind of delicate balance you're trying to strike, especially the way that in, in the style that you work, where it depends a, a lot on, on, on a lot of interesting textural effects, light, really subtle lighting effects, but then it also has to read clear enough from the distance to, to be interesting enough for people to even get close enough to see those effects at work. Huh? Well, yeah, and, <coughs> you know, there's, there's been this issue that I think a lot of artists have kind of come up against with certain pigments, notably oranges, that, you know, just haven't stood up to the test of time. And I did a whole lot of tattoos with these glowing orange-colored light forms or what have you, and they, uh, by and large, have all needed to be worked on again. And so, rather than just going over them again, with a different orange, and of course it is a different orange I'm using now, it's something I mix myself from a red and a yellow that, uh, it's the eternal light red and eternal lightning yellow that I've been using. And I've been having good luck with that, using that for about five years. But uh, I'm also using black where I wouldn't have used black before, and uh, doing some other things differently. And, uh, slowly but surely ad adapting the, the whole thing towards something that's more graphic but still conveys the kind of luminosity. You know, trying not to lose that because that's important. That's a, a chunk of what I'm trying to accomplish here is, is make the thing look like it's, it's lit up. Yeah. But yeah. that also requires using heavier shadows in places and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. there's, there's ways to produce light besides just pumping a bunch of orange in the skin. Yeah. Did, would you say that part of what helped you to kind of separate yourself er, earlier on in your career and get, get to this point is your um, willingness to kind of take those chances uh, with, you know, a, a lot of the, well, for example, not knowing that these fugitive oranges were going to do what they, what they did, but, but not relying so much on a traditional kind of tattooing approach where things were boldly outlined and, and, and contrast was pushed at every element, leaving areas large areas with a lot of color line, a lot of really, really light shapes, and then and then having enough kind of, uh, oh, I don't know, self-confidence to be like, well, that didn't, uh, or on self-honesty or whatever you want to call it, like, well, that didn't work as well as I'd hoped, maybe. Uh, I think, I think uh, I mean, a lot of it started out, I don't, I don't think uh, I had that traditional of an upbringing. And, uh, right off the bat, uh, I was influenced a lot by Jack Rudy, the fine line stuff he was doing and then uh, kind of fell in with people like Eddie Deutsch uh, and that crowd that were doing the more bold line stuff and so to me it made sense to do some stuff with bold lines and some stuff with fine lines and, mm -hmm. and uh, by and large that worked out it's just that as I explored further and went more into trying to make it look like a painting or what have you, mm -hmm. uh, you start to find that not all pigments are created equal. I mean, you can't just look at them for what they are you would, the way you would with a painting and say, uh, okay, this, is, this uh, orange is half as dark as this red and uh, so I can make a gradient from the red into the orange and it's always going to look like that nice gradient where in fact the red is going to brown out and the orange is going to turn into a light beige and that gradient is not going to be smooth anymore at that point because 
uh, they're not fading at the same rate. Yeah, yeah. And so that's something that, I mean, I mean obviously comes with, comes with experience and, and time, but uh, is that something that it, when you're making color value decisions, that, well, let's just say when you're making color decisions now, that's something that you're always keeping in mind is, uh, well, that's a transit. I, I, I have a solid idea of what this orange may do over time or what this red may do over time, so my, I'll approach a blend accordingly, or well, how, how do you use that practically? I don't know, as much as possible, I try to uh, get the, the whole thing to read pretty clearly without the light colors even being in place, so they're kind of like the frosting, you know? Mm -hmm. the, try to get enough contrast in the thing where uh, it's already got its structure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that even even in pieces where, like Gabe's hand, for example, uh, coming into this today, they had lost a lot right there in the wrist, but but because you rely uh, so much on, on strong contrast and, and, and strong dynamic shapes, uh, that area can almost go away, and obviously it's not, you wish it wouldn't, but it doesn't destroy the tattoo when, when, it, when something subtle like that does kind of go away. Yeah, I think... That's part of what I'm trying to accomplish with today's session is to bring enough uh, uh, black into the structure of this crystal that uh, the oranges are no longer going to be a, an element that's holding it together and instead just coloring it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, by and large, I, th I think that the lightning yellow has had a, had a good track record if you put it in well enough to begin with it. Yeah. It's uh, it stood the test of time, and I think that goes all the way back to what I believe was probably the same pigment, but uh, the old star bright yellow, mm -hmm. uh, which also had a very good track record. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were talking a little bit yesterday about uh, about the pigments themselves, and the, uh, and the, and you made a comment that there were really only about what did you say, seven or eight? Yeah, uh, so some very small number like that. Uh, so yeah, I want to mention that I had had a conversation with somebody at Eternal, and uh, she said that at their website you can, uh, and I, w I wish I could tell you the link. Uh, Maybe we can find it. Later. Okay, yeah. Uh, but we can actually see the ingredient list of each of these pigments and, and what the composition of the, uh, the proportion of the pigments, uh, those, those seven or eight root pigments, uh, make up each one of them, and so forth. For example, she said that the uh, main pigment in their orange is not present in the uh, light red, which, you know, so, so it's, it's interesting. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to actually look it up and, and take the time. If I, uh, right, but... Yeah. Uh, so we, we can figure out which are the, the fugitive pigments. We know that orange is, is uh, it, I mean, it's, it's being used by all the pigment manufacturers, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we know that it is not, uh, it looks great in the bottle, you know, but it is, does not hold up well, uh, especially people that get sun. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it would be really nice to be able to come up with a full palette that does not make use of that fugitive pigment. Sure. And for instance, the oranges that, that I uh, mix from the lightning yellow and the uh, light red uh, have been, and the crimson red too, you know, they, they make excellent oranges. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not unattractive at all. Uh, it's not like they're we're compromising any important thing. Yeah. Uh, how long would you say you've been ma making those mixtures and have you had, are you comfortable enough to say that, they, that they're standing the test of time better I'm, than the oranges? Yeah, I'm comfortable enough to say so far so good. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, um, let's, let's move on while we're talking about, uh, about bio-mech, bio-organic in, in general. You were just showing us earlier today the, so a few pages of the uh, biomech encyclopedia mm -hmm. that you've been working on for, what did you say, seven or eight years? Yep. Yeah, that's a long-term project. And, uh, and it's, it's obviously, it's going to be like an, an epic book. It's a giant book. It'll be a coffee table book for sure. Uh, and you are just super close to a release date. And it basically, just, just give a quick overview of what it is. I mean, it is an encyclopedia of the history of 
the art form. Is that right? Well, okay. It, it, it tries to touch on, on everything relevant that I was able to get in there. Now, there were a lot of things on my wish list, certain artists, including deceased artists, that I just couldn't uh, make arrangements to use their work, uh, a, f a few things like that, which, uh, um, you know, I was hoping to have a chapter on graffiti, but ran out of time. Uh, uh, a few other things, you know, so it's, it's as comprehensive as I was able to make it. Yeah. Uh, but it includes a lot of uh, what I think is really important stuff. And uh, so th th there are artist profiles, and this includes a few deceased artists, uh, like H.R. Giger, mm -hmm. Beksinski, uh, and a lot of artist profiles of living artists, including, you know, obviously a lot of tattooers, but uh, not exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, there's Z brush artists, sculptors, uh, um, etc. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we've got some uh, instructional sort of stuff, uh, educational chapters that were written by a variety of different people. There's been a lot of contributors, so it's not just all me and my boring droning voice. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, this includes uh, you know, there's, there's probably about 25 uh, contributors of written material. Yeah, yeah. That's and uh, uh, maybe 125 contributors of visual material. Hmm. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, collaborative stuff. Yeah. It, do you feel like it's a style that lends itself more to collaboration for some reason? Or is it just that you've kind of pushed the envelope a lot in doing collaborative tattoos and have, have influenced that? But I, I, I don't know, I think, I think any artists that seriously want to collaborate, I see stuff being done in all genres, especially like the, uh, the Timmy B crew, you know, yeah, they, sure. they've, been, they've been doing some stuff that's, that's really, I mean, technically beautiful and, and really good mix of the different styles and everything, so I wouldn't say that Biomech is necessarily more so, I think that it has to do with the cohesiveness of the community. Mm. You know, uh, when, when you've got a number of artists that uh, really admire each other's work. One thing that we run into a lot with bio that might be, I don't know, I mean, this probably happens in other styles too, you know, but uh, it's not like where, you know, Jeff Gogway gets to do a whole body suit. Yeah. You know, that's not how it is for us. We, we get clients that, and I'm one of them, want to collect from a bunch of different artists. And what ends up happening is it's still goes together really nicely as a bodysuit. It, it uh, is a style where you can get away with that. Yeah. And uh, so although none of us really get to do like a complete mech bodysuit, there are a lot of mech bodysuits walking around. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting that way. So, so we end up working next to and into each other's work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's semi-collaborative already just because of that. And we, we kind of learn from each other as we're doing it. It's like, oh, because uh, uh, McEwen here uh, ended up doing this interesting texture effect uh, on the edge of this thing where it kind of bridges into my piece. I can kind of steal that and bring it through more of my mm -hmm. piece there. And wow, look at how that wakes things up. And sure. so, so it's sort of a little bit quasi-collaborative in that way. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, 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 I'm glad you brought up Ty McEwen. He, he, in my opinion, is doing, it has really found a way to, to make it his own. I think his work's very recognizable. It does have a very soft kind of organic painterly feel that almost looks like it grows directly from the client's skin. I think he uses skin tone very cleverly as he pulls in, especially at the edges and stuff, and throughout the pieces. Um, and there's a, uh, I was flipping through uh, some of the pages that you'd shared of the encyclopedia and one of the one of the headlines that caught my attention that I ended up reading was um, yeah, how do I make this art for my own and you had a really interesting kind of compare and contrast with biomech and other other styles of tattoo and other art forms um, do you know where I'm going do, do you want to elaborate on kind of what how you compared it to traditional Americana tattooing to Japanese tattooing um, well okay I I guess part of the objective of this book is for people to understand that it's not a genre that belongs to a, a couple of particular artists like myself and Aaron Kane. And for a long time, I think there was that feeling that uh, that was the case. And of course, if 
the work that you end up doing looks a lot like my work or Aaron Kane's work, then then you're kind of missing the point of it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not just biomech in the sense of looking like a adaptation of Giger's work, you know, with with all the familiar elements. What we're talking about is is abstract tattooing in general, where you're intentionally kind of transforming the, the body into a abstract surface, you know, some, some kind of uh, flow, contrast, texture, interesting use of layering and dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, but this could be anything. It could be a very feminine, floral. Uh, it could be totally outer spacey and psychedelic. It could be super heavy, demonic, and aggressive. Uh, I think that so far, it's sort of associated as being on the more masculine end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was very hard to get a respectable number of uh, submissions from uh, women artists, although we do have a few very good examples, you know, and, and a lot of great examples of large scale bio on uh, <laughs> female collectors. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, I'm hoping to sort of dispel that myth too, because uh, definitely I feel that the field of abstract tattooing is something that is wide open mm -hmm. and uh, could go in any stylistic direction. And so that, yeah, that's sort of what we're trying to uh, encourage. So by looking at work from a lot of different artists and especially seeing all the different collaborative work in there where, where you kind of you know, hopefully what you'll take home from that is how malleable and mutable and open to evolution the style is. Mm -hmm. And that, yes, you can find some kind of abstract take on tattooing that is unique, uniquely yours, that people would recognize as yours, that doesn't look like something that's already been done. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it is not meant to be a flash book or something to copy any of the designs from it's that's completely not the point yeah yeah uh, and you, you bring up a, a, a good point a, a lot of people for many years I think you know through the 90s early 2000s uh, did see anyone else uh, approaching biomech at all as kind of ripping one of those handful of guys off and and to me looking back at it now um, there were a lot of very poor attempts at, at biomech and it's, and it's because I think in order to pull it off successfully, you really do have to have a pretty solid understanding of how light reveals form. Uh, a lot of it depends so much on, on interesting lighting effects and interesting textural effects uh, uh, or, you know, or reflective uh, things that, that if you're just trying to steal the tricks of biomech and not understanding the underlying principles that you're probably fighting a real uphill battle. Well. I think that it goes back to being able to draw in general, you know, and, and uh, I think people made the mistake of thinking that they could st sidestep their inability to draw by going abstract. Yeah. But that doesn't work because, you know, you're not going to understand flow or proportion or lighting or balance or basic composition, how to create tension and uh, you know how to, to make it look flattering on the body and sit in a way that is uh, um, strengthening the look of the musculature. You know that's that's something that uh, is is always part of the, the goal when I lay out a piece. Yeah. Uh, and I think that if I didn't know how to draw like a realistic human figure, I wouldn't be able to work, you know, well on a human figure as, as adequately as I'm able to. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that having just a core of uh, strong art skills is, is crucial no matter what style you're working in. And so uh, the, the people that, that I know that are the best at doing bio are good in general. They can do realism. They can, you know, they, they have some kind of style of other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Adrian Dominic with his, you know, crazy sort of pseudo-biblical paintings that he's done, you know, they look mm -hmm. like things from the 16th century, you know, uh, you know, Ty, he does uh, 
uh, sort of realistic cactus flowers and you know sometimes realistic tattoo machines and candles. He's, he's got great realism skills, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why you see that come through in, in the painterly qualities of his tattooing. Um, so he's taking his ability to render a realistic photograph and applying that towards putting those textures and, and effects onto his own imaginative shapes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something you see a, a lot from, from him as well is uh, uh, he's, he's constantly out in nature. He photographs, uh, he uses a lot of kind of macro photographs to, to see what kind of textures happen in the real world that he can adapt. Uh, you constantly see him with a sketchbook working from a small piece of a root or a branch or something like that. And, it's, uh, and, 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 and that's an important thing is, uh, uh, is just trying to use the, uh, uh, trying to use the, the, the tools that, that nature provides. And I mean, that's basically what this style is about, right? I think so, you know. Uh, I mean, that's what makes it interesting. Um, you know, we, we relate to these things naturally. Mm -hmm. Uh, we find nature fascinating and so if you come up with something uh, for a tattoo that that has some of that wonder and mystery of nature but at the same time contains some, so, some sort of uh, mysterious uh, you know artistic expression something that, that you look at and you're mystified by you know that's I think that that's part part of what good art does in general, you know, not just, just abstract stuff, but uh, uh, that it doesn't present you with the complete picture. Uh, you, you're, you're left with a sense of having to think about it. Yeah. Uh, of what it all meant and, and having your own take on it. Mm -hmm. back, to the, uh, back to that little excerpt from the, from the book that I was reading, you compared uh, Biomech as a relatively new art form as opposed to say a traditional um, uh, uh, um, sailor style tattoo where really it was not meant to, anyone can pull from a Sailor Jerry flash sheet and no one feels like they're plagiarizing or stealing or anyone can use a, 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 a design, a, a Japanese design that's been around for hundreds or however many years uh, and, and, and not feel like they're stealing from anyone but in, 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 uh, on the contrary feel like they're paying homage to whoever did that before, and this is a style that's really not quite old enough for that to be a thing yet. Well, sort of, yeah. I think, I think that uh, some styles are more open source than others, right? Yeah, yeah. And because, because Biomech is, a, is more recent, and because some of its originating kind of founding artists are still alive and kicking, um, it's, it doesn't feel as open source, right? But mm -hmm. the, the answer to that is that there's way more places that you could push it mm -hmm. that are, are uniquely gonna be that artist's voice. Um, where with traditional tattooing, there's only so much you can do with it before it's no longer traditional. Mm -hmm. you've, you've pushed it into new school or something. Yeah. And, uh, or with Japanese, it stops being Japanese once you've, you've made it, you know, it can be Japanese influenced, you know, but, but it's certainly not, uh, you know, authentic Japanese once you've taken it past a certain point mm -hmm. of, of personally interpreting it. So, uh, I think that you might have a little bit more room for a whole lot more artists to come up with complete universes of, of, new imagery and it still would be within this larger umbrella of what you might consider a biomech or, or a bioorganic or you know simply abstract tattooing yeah yeah do you have a fine line between what you consider biomech and bioorganic uh, are they I mean I have my own ideas of what I, I prefer not to force labels you know uh, yeah. for the purpose of the book we broaden the def definition to include all abstract tattooing that flows on the body in such a way as to create a sense of, of uh, uh, depth and uh, dimension. Yeah. Um, and this, this could be almost anything, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we've even got some 
uh, tribal uh, stuff oh. later in the book, Biomech Tribal, and this is stuff that, you know, is, it, it's, it's character, it's artistic character, it is, uh, is mechish, you know? Yeah. Because uh, obviously, you know, tribal in general, or, or black work, whatever you want to call it, is, is abstract tattooing, you know, sure. in, by and large. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about abstract tattooing in general, you know, so this is abstract uh, tattooing taken to, a, you know, a, a very fundamental, I mean, I think that's why people love black work. It's so fundamental. It's just positive and negative, mm -hmm. you know, or, or dot work. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and some of that stuff definitely does uh, occupy a stylistic bandwidth that, that you could call violent. You know, Brad Wooten, he's, he's one of them, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Yona Crank, hmm. uh, some, some really kind of, you know, very edgy sort of look, yeah. uh, but sort of futuristic, sort of fast and dangerous looking, you know, yeah. uh, and, and definitely with like those, those repeated, vent-like, kind of mechanical flavored uh, patterns and textures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't. I, I'm not. I'm not familiar with with the, the people that you that you just mentioned. But I'll absolutely uh, look them up. I've I've thought often as you know as you, you watch um, trends kind of come and go in, in tattooing that that at some point uh, a new version of tribal really has to make its way into our day to day lives. Do you oh, think? but it has. I think it's you been evolving like steadily. You know, mm -hmm. black workers have been doing all kinds of crazy shit. You know, it's. To the point where you, you might actually be sen desensitized to it if you're not paying close attention. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, right? And there's a few of these these artists I follow that, that are super impressive, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and their stuff is definitely not uh, just the '90s tribal over and over again, you know, with some dot work thrown in, you know. Yeah. Uh, Tomas, Tomas, that guy. Oh, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's stuff is crazy, you know. It's it's like it's like a a ripple, you know, the body was struck with the right harmonic, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, yeah. There's this guy who goes by Black Symmetry, uh, who he uh, he apprenticed under Matt Black and ended up um, very quickly and early in his career scoring a really awesome client that was like, just do the whole body and and. He knocked it out of the park, and so now he's got a career of doing this stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it's just so impressive. It's it's uh, it's whole body concept work. Yeah. Uh, and so this is what this is something you see more in black work than probably any other genre is clients that are like, yeah, do the whole body. Yeah. And you know maybe it's because like with a Japanese body suit, it's a huge commitment, you know. Yeah. Uh, and. With that kind of black work, you could probably uh, get through it with a, with a few less hours and, and whatever expensive visits out of state or whatever it is that it takes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For whatever reason, you see more body suits and, and uh, black work than I think anything else. And uh, and I do th I do think it's been steadily evolving. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I guess you're right. And I think that's probably. We, what it is is that I'm just a little bit numb. I, I'm not classifying it the same way. I'm thinking more '90s tribal and what the evolution of that is. And you're probably right. We're already looking at the evolution of that in a lot of these, in a lot of these large scale blackboard pieces. So when is the, um, so we're what we're December 2018. So what bio the biomech encyclopedia is going to be in people's hands when? Okay, if nothing goes wrong, all right. So what could possibly go wrong? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the storm we're having right just, now. Yeah, there's a storm right now. My computer to blow up or something. But uh, if nothing goes wrong, uh, I'm hoping to debut it at the Hell City Convention in Columbus in uh, April, April 26th through 28th. Awesome. And people who uh, supported the Kickstarter uh, will be mailing their copies out before that convention. Uh, but the it'll be available to, public, the, to the public the first time at that convention. And then from that point on, we'll have it in the catalog, at least as long as we have it. Yeah. 
Do you know what the print run is going to be? How many you'll actually have? We're going to start with 2,000. That's what our situation is going to allow for, uh, simply because the book is so big and deluxe. Yeah, I don't know if we dove into just how, how big it is, but what you were just showing me, and I'll, I'll pan across, I'll drop some, uh, uh, drop some images in of, of what we're looking at. You said it's about 90% of the actual book size? That's 80? 92%. So the, 92%. the book is, is 13 by 10 inches per page. Okay. Uh, and how many pages? Uh, it's it going to end up being two volumes, roughly 350 pages per volume. So I don't okay. have a, a final page count, but Somewhere so right it's significant. In there. Yeah. yeah, big. Yeah, and so it, it comes in two volumes that are uh, in a, a slip case, hmm. uh, a fabric slip case with sort of this uh, metallic sticker thing. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's pretty deluxe. Yeah. Uh, but the the content of the book itself has just been such a labor of love through the years, and and I don't want it to make it sound like this has just been me because. There's other artists who also have put in hundreds of hours of their own time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people like Dan Hazelton and, and uh, um, Marcus Lenhard and uh, Thad Minnick. And uh, they, that list is actually endless. There, there's been some incredible supporters of this project that have put in amazing amounts of hours uh, getting together these collaborative pieces, uh, which, which are part of the, the book's content. So. So, uh, you know, earlier we were talking about genres, what's, what's bio-organic and what's bio -mech and, you know. So we have a little fun with that. Uh, yeah. we, we came up with a whole bunch of different sort of sub-genres just, just for the sake of being able to kind of categorize the material yeah, so it wasn't just one big endless lump of bio -mech that caused your brain to go numb after a while, but instead, it tells a little bit of a story and, and shows some of the different language that use. So we've got, you know, architectural, botanical, mm -hmm. uh, industrial, yeah. alien, futuristic, steampunk, etc. You know, so we've got a bunch of those. We've got 135 chapters or something like that. Oh, wow. Now that also includes a lot of artist profiles. It also includes a lot of uh, instructional uh, articles and for example you were just talking about Ty McEwen and his uh, references mm -hmm. uh, he wrote uh, a four page article oh. uh, for the book about his use of references and how he incorporates them into his uh, tattooing and his painting and his uh, artistic language in general so it's so it's not so much just a um, a record of, of this style but there, there's a lot of kind of practical how to like if someone were interested in the style you could get uh, you could find some good starting points on reference material to use. Thing, Absolutely. To There's also a lot of digital tutorials, you know, using ZBrush, Photoshop, uh, mm -hmm. and, and other apps for, uh, you know, you've you got some really interesting stuff. Uh, uh, some very accomplished people, both from in and outside the tattoo world, uh, have contributed to this project. Yeah, yeah, it sounds. Yeah, I mean, just in the little bit that I've seen, I can tell it. It was a, a huge, huge undertaking, and it's crazy to think that eight years of your life will be. That's a major chapter, kind of closing, huh? Yeah, although it's not going to close up quite yet, because this coming year is still going to be all about it, and yeah, I'm still going to have to finish some of the paintings. I I owed seventy one paintings from that Kickstarter thing. Oh wow! And uh, I'm down to about. 14, but I came to a point where I had to just put that aside and finish the book. So yeah, that's that's what I'm doing right now. And uh, yeah. yeah, we, we should have uh, the, the books in time for uh, getting them out to our supporters and then, and then uh, bringing a cargo pallet full of them to uh, Columbus. Yeah. Sp speaking of Kickstarter, and obviously you're appreciative of the people of the backers what how was that experience for you overall is it something you consider a success or well absolutely no so some people might think that kickstarter is about donating money and and so i want to clarify that was not about donating money what this what crowdfunding means in this sense now it's not like gofundme which is about donating money mm -hmm. uh, is that i was pre-selling copies of the book or paintings or t-shirts or whatever uh, in order to fund the book. Yeah. 
and you know we had to meet a certain financial goal or we wouldn't get any money from it. So it's an all or nothing thing. Yeah. And our, our uh, goal was 40,000. We ended up making about 80, yeah, um, which has proven to just barely be enough to, you know, I ended up uh, using some, some of the time, buying some time with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it, that, it just, I never could have imagined how much time it's actually taken hmm. to do this and to do it right yeah. and to do it justice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a good point. I'm glad you bring that up about, about Kickstarter. It's really no different than, than any other venture, uh, you know, reaching out for, for capital for, in exchange for some percentage of ownership, you know, in the, in the venture capital angel investment world. But the, but the thing that makes it better, in my mind, or unique is that you're actually pitching to people who care about the, the product and the end result rather than, rather than some venture capital fund that just is looking for an in and an out. Right. They actually want a copy of the thing. Yeah. And uh, that's uh, I've never I've never I've never done a Kickstarter campaign, but I do think that that's the that's the true beauty of it is because typically you're drawn to the things that you actually want to see happen, and you're like, well, yeah, I'll back that. I actually want to see it, and that's a uh, uh, while it's a really common model. Uh, it, what's uncommon about it is that it's funded by people who actually give a shit about it. Um, so um, before we before we wrap up, and we're about at forty minutes, so we're probably probably getting there. Um, Reinventing. Does anything from the Biomech Encyclopedia is it? Uh, is there any spillover into the living kind of um, digital version of reinventing the tattoo? Are you have you drawn a lot from? What are the? Are there any parallels between the two? Are you pulling some stuff from the book and doing um, chapters of it? Or are they not? Can... Not really. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be redundant. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it's important to me that people feel like. I mean, there, there's there's going to be stuff they've seen before, obviously, because these days. It's hard to hide. I mean, I, there's some artists that hide stuff really successfully, like Adrian Lee or Grime, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, occasionally they'll publish something and it's like stuff nobody's ever seen. But mm -hmm. most of us post everything, you know, and people have seen it all. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to do is, is, uh, is show a different take on things. So, for example, there's, there's a cover-up chapter in Reinventing and there's a cover-up chapter in the Encyclopedia. And... There's a tiny amount of crossover there, uh, but it's it's not like I've taken the cover-up chapter from reinventing and just you know copied copy and pasted. It. Right, exactly. It's a it's a completely new chapter and with new writing and, and new photos and, and uh, um, you know one of our contributors, Shane Smith, had, had an example that I just thought was so. Uh, helpful to show, you know, I didn't want to not show it just because I already had it in reinventing because yeah. it's, it's such a good idea of how to deal with a particular situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, the, there's, there's going to be a little bit of overspill like that, but no, it's, it's all, it's all new material. Yeah. Well, we were talking a little bit, um, uh, today and, and, and stop me if you don't want me to, to talk about this, about, about the, for the members of reinventing the possibility of doing some uh, some fairly regular live streaming uh, with with you. Do we want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we want to bring that up because I think we're going to do a test, uh, you know, later on in an hour or two. Um, There's more than an hour of this tattoo. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the the idea being that people that subscribers to re to the online version or the uh, of reinventing the tattoo would have uh, the ability to kind of to watch live tattooing on a pretty regular right, basis, right. ask okay. questions. So, mm -hmm. the, of course, this is inspired by being able to do live webcasts using Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, webcasting used to be such a big freaking undertaking, you know? Yeah. You had to have a team of technicians on standby, and uh, now you just point your phone and click a button. You know, it's crazy <laughs> how much easier it's gotten. Yeah. Uh, these kids have no idea. Uh, but uh, at first I thought I would do a members only account for reinventing members at, uh, on Instagram and just do some, some live feeds there that were a lot more technical than the stuff that I uh, do on my uh, Guy Aegis and Art account where you know I try to avoid technical talk as much as possible because it's just uh, it's too public. Mm -hmm. But, uh, 
you know, we thought about it and it's going to be a lot easier for people if they can just log in through their uh, Reinventing the Tattoo account uh, to, to go to the live uh, feed. So uh, I think that it's not going to be done using Instagram video, but instead using uh, Ustream or something like that. Yeah. And uh, we're going to do a Ustream test tonight, although I know you're, you're not uh, editing this. I mean, you this is not live. Yeah, it's uh, not live. It's, yeah, still, we'll, we'll get the point. Ta, uh, just for a second, I, just, I, I, and I feel like we probably discussed this to, the, the, on the last show that we did, but you talk about not getting too much into technical stuff, um, except for in your members' area. And, for, and most everyone that's, that's a member of Reinventing has, has shown that they're... Uh, they're a professional tattoo or, or in an apprenticeship or, or somehow associated with the um, with with the industry. Correct. Um, what you know as as we continue to evolve in the information age and and you know you know that we can you can, in big cities you can literally walk into tattoo supply houses and buy everything without showing any type of a license or anything whatsoever. Are we are we still doing a good service by not offering decent information uh, to the general? public, are, are, are we giving them access to weapons and not teaching them how to use them? Um, I don't know. I, uh, I think that uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine wanting to uh, put the time and effort into proper educational material without, um, I don't know, it's, it, let me rephrase this. I, uh, I think that certain things are kind of uh, common knowledge anymore to anyone, any tattoo jockeys out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of them, I, I don't know. I mean, I definitely come from the background where you're just going to breed more tattooers if it becomes too easy mm. and uh, maybe it's past the point of worrying about that so then it, then really it's a matter of I became an educator in this business with the blessing of the community mm -hmm. they didn't say no you can't share that but I always tried to make it clear that I was not going to be overly public, that I was going to try to teach it to professionals only as much as, as it was within my ability to enforce. Mm -hmm. And that is what has made it okay. Sure. Is there's been this agreement, this sort of informal agreement. And, and uh, as a result of that, you know, the, the old timers were okay with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's hard for me to say, oh, well, times have changed. And so, yeah, we should just educate everyone so that uh, anyone who gets their hands on a tattoo machine can compete with the guy who has spent a life trying to build up a reputation for his shop mm -hmm. just because we want to do, you know, harm reduction. So that's that's a tough one, you know, because because yeah. yeah, I want to look out for the general public, but I also want to look out for the the people who have invested into the industry over their lifetimes, you know. And there's there's a lot of people who have really felt the pinch yeah. of uh, you know. Once upon a time, if if you did a couple of conventions and maybe had a magazine appearance every year and a half or so, uh, you would you would stay busy, you know, you were, you were exercising due diligence, you know, you were proving yourself, you were getting your work out there, uh, and people would find you because you were, you know, obviously uh, professional and, and on top of your game. But none of that stuff matters, okay? Anymore, now, if you've posted something impressive on social media, even if it's had the fuck photoshopped out of it, yeah. you know, um, you are going to pull business away from the person who has spent their life trying to build their shop. Yeah. And so um, that's a tough one. Yeah. Right? It is. It is. Yeah, I agree. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your opinion. A lot of people are, uh, 
uh, I think that's one of the big dilemmas, big challenges that we have, especially with you know being in a tattoo education business or in an in in information sharing and uh, and and, uh, and it, it's a it's a slippery slope. I I feel like we. At Fireside, we've we're in pretty good contact with our following, and, and the people that I think of whenever we do hand out any technical information are, are the people who've reached out to us with the with the really common issue of, hey, I live in Marion, Illinois. I live in a very small town. There are really I'm, I'm in a real dead end apprenticeship. My mentor can't draw. Um, I'm I'm learning everything I can from them. I'm learning online. Um, you know, and the thing is, is they're learning literally everything else online, and it's just like, will you just help me get over the hump with this problem too? Uh, and there's no doubt there, that's not everyone. There, there are definitely people out there that are, you know, that are kitchen magicians and working out of their houses and uh, and and causing more harm than good. But there are definitely a lot of people out there that are just looking for, you know, a crumb, <laughs> you know, well, making and, a real effort. And I, I also have met many artists who have gone on to have big names in the industry, some of the, the most well-known artists today, had to teach themselves. Sure. And if they had uh, waited around for an apprenticeship to open up, they might never have become what they are. Mm -hmm. And what can you say to that? Right. That they should have just kept their, their job at the uh, machine shop and, and you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting problem, uh, and one we'll continue to work on, I'm sure. Uh, all right, well, we're, we're, we're closing up on an hour. Uh, so, Hell City in April. We're hoping that uh, we have encyclopedias in the hands of everyone who who wants one. Whatever is left will be available on the, what, Tattoo... Um, uh, is it Tattooeducation.com tattoo or hyperspacestudios.com will have them. Have them on. And uh, for the time being, it's just going to be available through us. We're not going to be wholesaling them at all. Yeah, at first. Yeah. And then, is there a possibility, uh, before we close up, of doing a, a second run of these if they do If well? they do well, absolutely. Yeah. And, and if the situation calls for it, uh, I might do a second edition. Uh, yeah. Because it's been hard to, to stop improving the thing, and that's one of the th things that's taken it so long. So, uh, yeah, if I do a second run, it might be a, a uh, modified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, improved second run. Yeah, and finally, if people are interested in uh, reinventing the tattoo, reinventingthetattoo.com, it's an annual uh, um, membership, uh, updated pretty regularly. A lot of guest chapters by artists that you will know. Yeah, that you uh, it's got a lot of uh, video material in it, webinars, mm -hmm. um, typically an hour and a half long that that I've done. <clears throat> so that right there, those those are. Uh, you know things that would have as DVDs sold for a hundred bucks or whatever. Yeah. And you know, so we've we've got seven or eight of those. About to add another one. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so we we probably add three to four of those every year. Yeah. And already you're you're getting more than your money's worth from it just from that. And then we uh, have the core content, which is everything that was in the book before, although that's. Uh, having new material added to it regularly, and it's not all just mine either. Uh, we are trying to uh, include enough different styles, you know, realism and illustrative tattooing and that kind of thing, uh, so that it's not just a guide to biomech. You know, that's that's one thing about reinventing that's very distinctly different from the encyclopedia. Yeah, yeah, and you know, um, you know, for everyone, that I. I uh, I hope that I didn't. This episode didn't come off as, as too salesy, but I just think it's very important. Um, the reason that one of the reasons that I wanted to set up and do this today, I think it's important that we're always investing in, in ourselves. Uh, and if you don't see, you know, a, 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 a book or a course uh, as a as a way to get better, then you probably are never going to get better. That's the way. It's a way we. It's a way we learn. Uh, so I hope you will consider it. Uh, Check out uh, Biomech Encyclopedia. Check out Reinventing the Tattoo. Check out Fireside Foundations. Uh, check out um, TattooNow.com. What Gabe didn't really get to say too much today. But uh, anyways, thanks as always for supporting what we do. I had a blast here. I think I've drank up all the hyperspace beer. So probably going to have to call it pretty soon. <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks.